We're marking 10 years since the Kohelet Policy Forum was founded. Uh, I can safely say that Kohelet is one of Israel's leading think tanks and definitely the most influential. Spearheading this endeavor is Moshe Kopel, founding chairman, uh, who is also a professor of mathematics and computer science at Bar Ilan University. Professor Kopel has been active in the policy world for at least two decades, um, foremostly leading the uh, initiative on creating a constitution for the state of Israel. Professor Kopel, it is such a pleasure to speak to you today. Oh, the pleasure is mine. Thank you. So let's just start with the basics. Um, why was Kohelet founded in the first place? Well, I, I thought there were, you know, there were some problems uh, in Israeli society and particularly in the policies of the Israeli government that needed to be addressed, uh, principally three. One was uh, that Israel was founded to be the nation state of the Jewish people and there were signs that, that Israel's Jewish identity was weakening. Uh, secondly, Israel is a democracy, and uh, I found that representative democracy in Israel was being weakened in the sense that the, uh, there were certain bureaucracies, uh, certain imbalance that, that, that had gotten more power than they, they really should have. There were certain um, lacks of, of um, checks and balances between the branches of government uh, and so forth that, that uh, caused a, what I would call a, a deficit of democracy. And finally, and maybe most importantly, I was concerned about freedom in the state of Israel. Uh, there was a, a legacy of socialist economics, and in, in general, uh, it was important to me that, uh, that the citizens of Israel um, uh, benefit from liberty, from the liberty uh, in the name of which the state of Israel was founded. Very clear. Uh, I have to ask, you're a math professor in a field that's pretty much dominated by you know, those social sciences or humanities or even law. Um, so what makes you qualified, or at least in the eyes of your colleagues in the ivory tower, to, to tackle you know, the, the current discourse in Israel? Okay, so uh, it's true that uh, this is probably not the career path that uh, you would expect a math professor to take, but there's, there's a certain way of thinking, a certain analytic way of thinking, I think, that uh, you know, mathematicians, computer scientists are accustomed to, which I try to bring to bear. But, uh, but in any event, I, I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't see it as a, um, as a disadvantage to come from that background. You mentioned Israel as, the, as the, the nation state of the Jewish people. Isn't it obvious, though, that this is the Jewish state? I mean, does it need to be legislated, whether through constitution or otherwise? So the answer to that is yes, I think it does. It does need to be legislated. Um, first of all, uh, take note that there, there was a lot of domestic opposition to the nation state law, right? I mean, the nation state law is not a law that says that, that the Jews have rights that non-Jews do not have in Israel. It says very, very elementary things uh, that the flag of the state of Israel is the Magen David, which is a symbol of the Jewish people, that Hebrew is the language uh, of, of the state of Israel, um, that the calendar is the Jewish calendar. Now, every country has a calendar and a flag, right? So it's not as if you can be neutral on this. Nevertheless, there was tremendous opposition. You know, the law only passed with a, with a small majority. It was something like, uh, I remember, 62 to 57. Uh, I don't recall exactly, but that's roughly. Right. No, roughly but wait, so what you're saying is because that there was opposition, that justifies the need for it? Yes, exactly. I know that that seems ironic, but the point is that if the nature of Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people had not been the subject of debate, if it had really been so obvious, as you suggest, that, that uh, you know, everybody would just say, well, of course, then, then there would have actually been no need for it. It's, it's, it's the fact that this had become the subject of debate that made it necessary, in addition to which, I, I, you know, I don't need to tell you that, that uh, the idea of a Jewish nation state is anathema to most of the world, right? I mean, the amnesty report, which is absurd, just came out um, that Israel's an apartheid state. Uh, there are dozens of nation states in the world all of whom have particular flags and particular languages and particular calendars and have particular rules about repatriation of, of uh, uh, those who share the, you know, the culture and, uh, uh, and background of, of that country. And uh, that's all fine, but in the case of Israel, it's been challenged. So precisely because it's been challenged, I thought it was necessary that we actually enshrine all these very elementary things in law. And what about the, the freedom perhaps of, of, of 
other populations in Israel, maybe the minorities, the, the law itself, or when you're talking about Jewish state in, in, in general, inherently discusses the Jews. So what does it say about the, you know, the right to freedom for minorities? Okay, so, so it, it should be perfectly obvious, and, and uh, there's absolutely not a word in the law that contradicts this, that in terms of their civil rights, in terms of the political rights, there's absolute equality between uh, Jews and non-Jews in Israel, and we've never argued uh, that it should be any different, and there's nothing in the law that suggests that it should be any different. So that's not the point. The point of the law is, is that the, uh, the level of, of symbols, calendar, uh, and, and so forth, where a choice has to be made, and it's perfectly reasonable that in, in the nation state of the Jews, that they should be chosen uh, in, in accordance with the Jewish preferences and tradition. Okay. Uh, Kahalat? Uh, obviously pushes towards uh, limiting government involvement in our daily lives. Um, but as a Zionist, don't you think that there should be some sort of exception made when it comes to local businesses or Israeli businesses? Okay, so uh, I think that uh, Israeli businesses, Israeli industries need protection, but they don't need protection from competition, uh, including from foreign competition. They need protection from the Israeli government. The uh, <laughs> The Israeli government, unfortunately, uh, has put up so many obstacles to, to opening a business and to maintaining a business in Israel uh, that uh, it, it really hampers the ability of, of people to, to open businesses and make a living and, and advance uh, Israeli uh, prosperity. First of all, you know, there are so many taxes and fees and whatever that, that is just costly to do business here. But beyond that, uh, there are so many regulations, right? I mean, if you want to open a business, you have to get the approval of the fire department and the health department and the police department and the agriculture department and the environment department and, and so forth. You also, to practice almost any profession, you, you need all kinds of licenses, even when there's no particular justification for that. So it is hard to do business in Israel. But, uh, so that's when we need protection from, okay? We need to have less regulation. But in fact, what's going on is that, um, that the Israeli government is supposedly protecting us from foreign competition, right? And it does this in many ways. First of all, there are tariffs that make it difficult to, uh, to import. Uh, and then there are standards, right? So, so if, if, you know, if you want to import a toy that already has passed the standards test of, of the U European Union or the United States, so Israel has its own standards uh, that you have to pass that are typically, because of regulatory capture, typically designed by local manufacturers who, who, you know, who then make sure that the standard is exactly what they do and you know, a millimeter more than, than, than what you can import from Europe, right? It's very, very convenient that happens a lot. So there was a time here when Heinz, which invented ketchup and actually had trademarked the word ketchup, was not allowed to call its ketchup ketchup because Osim had, you know, 0.001% more tomato paste in, in that. Oh, so it's tomato sauce, right? That was Yeah, they there. had to give it some, some other you know, euphemism, which is really bizarre. Uh, and, then, and then even if you manage to get past all of those hurdles, you've, you've got to get the stuff into the docks, and you've got the dock worker unions that, uh, that have slowdowns, and if you try to go around them, as, as they're trying to do now because of these slowdowns, uh, they threaten you with a strike. So all of these things make it very hard, uh, you know, to, to import. Now, now, what happens is, if, if, you, if you can't import, it's not that you've protected Israeli businesses, now they're going to do better. What happens is that instead of uh, having the benefits of comparative advantage and bringing in what other companies are able to do uh, more efficiently than us, other countries are able to produce more efficiently than us, uh, we instead end up uh, manufacturing things that we shouldn't be, and we don't have the benefits of competition. So there's, the result is there's low efficiency because there's not enough incentive for the domestic producers to be efficient. The prices are higher because you don't have the cheaper goods coming in from abroad to compete. Uh, and then once that happens and prices go up, then you have all this pressure to have price controls, right? which is a catastrophe. So of course, the government you know, gives into these you know, populist demands and they, start, they have price controls on all, all different kinds of products. And uh, the price controls uh, then keep 
the, the, the fixed price keeps getting pushed up because since the manufacturers here are inefficient, they say, hey, we can't afford to produce them at that price. And they, they keep lobbying to get the price pushed up. And eventually, of course, there are shortages. And, uh, and then so we're, pay we're paying at the end, and, at the end of the day right, more the than... The end result is that we wanted to protect some inefficient farmer up north. And instead, the entire population of Israel, and in particular, the, the, you know, the least advantaged people, end up paying way more than they should be paying. So, so a few people get, get some advantage, and the vast majority of people end up paying more than they should for, qua for quality that's not as good as it should be. Speaking about something you said a little bit earlier when you talked about Kohelet's uh, main, main goals, um, I think it's safe to say that Israel you know, it, we're doing okay here. Uh, life is good. Israel consistently ranks high in, you know, all indexes that measure quality of life and happiness. But yet, you, you're warning us about this, this threat to our freedom, this threat to our liberty. Uh, could you expand on that a little bit? Oh, of course. So, uh, first of all, let me make clear that I love Israel. I love living in Israel, and I think that Israel has a brilliant future ahead of it. So, e even, you know, I'm a policy shop. I try to fix things, okay? So, it, when, you're, when your job is to fix things, you focus on the things that are broken, all right? So, so but to be fair, uh, Israel's a wonderful country. There are, however, two main areas where freedom and democracy are threatened. The first one is the legacy of socialism, which I was just describing to you, and that, that uh, limits our freedom to do business, and it, it, it slows down our, uh, our growth and prosperity. But the second, the second threat, which is a threat both to freedom and, and to the whole democratic system, is the fact that we have a very politicized police and prosecution apparatus, and courts, right? All these have become extremely, extremely politicized. Uh, the way you see this, I mean, the attitude of, of, the, um, of the judicial bureaucracy in particular, but basically all the lawyers, you know, who are in, in government service, um, their attitude is they, they call themselves the Shomrei Hasaf, right? The, you know, the, the, gate, the gatekeepers, right? The assumption here is that politicians are crooks, they're self-interested, and that all of these self-appointed gatekeepers who uh, you know, work as, as government lawyers or as judges or you know, in the attorney general's office and so forth, they are always pure as the driven snow. They never have, they're never self-interested. They never have any institutional interests. All they want is cosmic justice, right? And, um, and therefore, they're, they're forever, they treat the politicians as suspects, right? So when, when a politician actually wants to advance a policy, you've got these, you've got these government lawyers that are going, well, we don't, yeah, we don't like that policy. And that, you say, well, so what? They're, they're not the ones who got elected, right? It's the people who got elected who make policy. But unfortunately, that's not true. In, in some unfortunate uh, Supreme Court decisions in the 90s, uh, the court decided, particularly uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Aaron Barak at the time, decided that the Attorney General, who was just a bureaucrat, right, who's appointed, that the Attorney General, uh, uh, when he has an opinion about the law, as the government's legal advisor, what he says is binding, right? So the idea was that his interpretation of the law would be the default interpretation of the law. So when the government is deciding what's legal and what's not legal, by law, they would, they would consult with him and, 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 uh, and what he says would be determinative. Now, and this is also unique to Israel, isn't it? Oh, that's totally unique to Israel, but, but that, you know, if all it was was, you know, start with what the Attorney General says as a default position, that might have somehow been tolerable. But what it became was anything the attorney general says, that's absolutely binding. So, so uh, the attorney general, uh, not only did he um, issue legal opinions and said this is binding, no, he also started saying, well, you know what? It's illegal formally for the government to do things that are unreasonable. Of course, what's unreasonable, right? And, and he, started, he started telling the government, th like, oh, no, you can't do that. They, why can't we do that? Well, you know, it's problematic. Hmm. But, so, so basically, the, the, the Israeli government is no longer actually the sovereign here, right? They're not, they, are not, they are not the boss. On top of them, you have an attorney general who tells, you know, says whatever he wants. And, and here's the weird thing. Supposing the government says, 
Uh, no, that's, that's not what we, you know, we, we heard your opinion, that's not what we want to do. And so we're gonna do, we're gonna do something else because we think it's perfectly fine, right? Um, who defends them in court? There's inevitably going to be a petition against it. Uh, and The Attorney General. The Attorney General is the one who's supposed to defend them in court. And the Attorney General goes to court and says, no, they're wrong, my client is wrong, pay no attention to them. So the government says, well, if, if you don't agree with us, let us just defend ourselves in court, or let's bring a private lawyer. But you can't pay for it. Somebody. No, not only can, the, the attorney general actually says, you can't bring another lawyer. You simply can't bring another lawyer. So it, it's, kind of, it's kind of absurd. Um, and then besides for that, the attorney general is also the head of, he's the chief prosecutor, okay, effectively. He's the head of the whole prosecution apparatus in Israel. And lo and behold, the prosecution has been so politicized. There has not been a prime minister in the last 25 years that has not been under criminal investigation, not one. And half of the justice ministers have been under criminal investigation, right? So, so what happens is that, that in order for this judicial bureaucracy to, to keep its power, not, not only does it, does it get absurd powers that are granted to it by the court, but on top of that, it also has this threat. Every Israeli politician knows that if they try to do something that, that the judicial bureaucracy doesn't like, they're very likely to be investigated. Nobody likes to be investigated. But isn't the, you know, isn't the nature of the courts being you know, one of the three branches that are supposed to provide checks and balances within our democratic governance, uh, isn't its nature to protect the people? Aren't, isn't yes, and uh, I am absolutely uh, in, in favor of having checks and balances and having the courts oversee that, that everything that the government does is in accord with, uh, with the basic laws, which is Israel's constitutional legislation. However, um, the courts mostly uh, work to enhance their own power. So, uh, for example, uh, in, in any court in the world, who can come to court? Who can, who can bring a petition to the court uh, against the government? The answer is somebody who has standing. Somebody has right. standing only if they themselves were directly affected by something, right? Not as taxpayers, right? It's not, well, I'm a taxpayer and I don't like government policy. That would not get you standing in any court anywhere. Uh, you have to come to court and say, this particular policy unfairly harms me in a direct way. Now, uh, the Israeli courts have gotten rid of this, this restriction, so that one of, one of the ways that we, you know, that we limit the power of the court vis-a-vis -vis the, the, uh, the government is by limiting standing. That's gone. Right, and that's why we also see now a lot of international actors uh, play, you know, coming in on behalf of... That's right. You've had, you've had the UN petitioning the court on, on behalf of, 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 il, of, of uh, illegal uh, immigrants to Israel uh, and so forth. The, the, the second way that they've enhanced their own power is that in general um, there are limits on what's justiciable. There are certain issues, certain kinds of issues, that simply belong to, you know, to the other branches of government, right? Uh, to, to the executive branch and, and to the uh, legislative branch. And the courts just don't get involved in those kinds of issues, right? I mean, things like war and peace, right? Uh, or treaties, the, 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 the courts aren't supposed to get involved in that. Um, if the government wishes to appoint, you know, people which, which it has the, the authority to do, the courts aren't supposed to go in and say, well, we don't like your appointment, that's not the court's job. Uh, but the courts here, again, under Aaron Barak in the 90s, they just got rid of, it was actually in the 80s already, they got, they got rid of justiciability limits. Basically, you know, Aaron Barak's famous saying was, Hakol Shafit, everything is justiciable, right? And then the grounds, the grounds for, for overturning legislation, uh, usually um, it's not enough to say we disagree with it, right? You don't say, it's, well, it's unreasonable, right? It's unreasonable. W unreasonable is just a euphemism for, well, you know, w we, we would have done something differently than you, right? We have different policies. Reminds uh, me of my kids saying, low bali. Low just bali, <laughs> right. I, yeah, I don't, I don't, don't like it. Like it. it. <laughs> exactly, I don't feel like it. I don't feel like it. So, so all of that, right, all of that is, is just the court overreaching. Or, now, the latest, the latest outrage is, well, okay, so the basic laws were declared by Barack to be constitutional legislation, and therefore uh, uh, 
if, if uh, an ordinary statute is found to be, uh, co you know, co to contradict a basic law, then we say that the basic statute uh, has to give way, right? The, the statute has to give way to the, to the basic law. Um, there's nothing higher in the hierarchy of Israeli law than, than the basic laws. But now they got the, the nation state law, which, you know, which is a basic law, which the court doesn't like in particular. And uh, suddenly they discovered this new idea. They can actually even rule on the constitutionality of basic laws. Now, there's, there's absolutely no basis for that whatsoever. I mean, on w what grounds are you going to use to rule that the Constitution itself, or what you declared was the Constitution, is unconstitutional? Yeah, right, if there's there, no starting point. Right, right. There's, no, there's nothing above it in the hierarchy, so right. none of this makes sense. So they said, well, you know, there are general principles that we have in our own heads. That's, now, that's an outrage, right? But, but the scary thing is that it's also a way of the court cementing its power forever, because one of the ways that you have checks and balances in general is that, well, the government can always pass constitutional legislation, right? And that's above everything. So if they don't like the way the courts have been using constitutional legislation, they can, they can amend it, right? And, and send a message to the court saying, no, we don't like the way you're using that legislation in order to, to rule against the statutes. But now they, the court basically said, no, you can't do that either. If you try to change the rules of the game, and in particular with regard to the court's own power, how judges are appointed and so forth, oh, well, we get to review that, okay? Now, now bear in mind, what I didn't say is that, that the courts, the sitting justices have a veto on new appointments to the Supreme Court, which is another obvious uh, kind of check and, you know, checks and balances that, that every government in the world has against the court. Israel doesn't have that. Right, it's like an old boys club. Like we're it really is. Right. So, so uh, in, in general, the, there's a, a, I, I would love to have a reasonable Supreme Court here that actually did provide checks and balances to the government, but, but instead what we have is, is a court that's drunk with its own power and out of control. Um, very clear. Let's talk a little bit about the activities of Kohelet itself, uh, what you guys do here on a daily basis. Uh, if you had to pick, what do you think your main achievements would be? All right, so, you know, it's tempting to say uh, we passed this law, we passed that law, we passed the other law, and the truth of the matter is that we did write lots of laws uh, and we did see them through and they, and they did get passed. But I think it would be a mistake to go down that path. Uh, first of all, because it, I, I think it's arrogant and inaccurate to say that we passed a law. Uh, laws don't get passed that easily. There's a process, and in the final analysis, it, it's the legislature that passes the laws. And it's important to say that because the legislature, you know, the legislators uh, are the ones who ultimately have to take responsibility for those laws as well. So, so we did our share there, um, but um, we can't we can't take credit for those things, and we shouldn't. Uh, but also, I think it, it's legislation that we passed is not the most important thing we do. Um, for every law that we passed, we probably prevented 20 laws from passing that were bad and shouldn't get passed, okay? In, in, in general, uh, preventing the government from doing mischief is more important than, than actually getting new laws passed. And so I, I think that that really is a bigger achievement as far as I'm concerned than, than the laws that we passed. Um, but I think most importantly maybe is that uh, we've in many respects together with others changed the whole way that the, what I'm gonna call the national camp, that you know, right-wingers in Israel, what the agenda of, of the right is. It used to be that the, the agenda of the right-wing in Israel was just uh, settlements and, and things like that, just be hawkish on, on defense policy and so forth. Um, now, uh, the idea of freedom, the idea of, right, of individual liberty, the idea of letting businesses operate without, uh, without the heavy hand of government regulation, um, the whole problem of checks and balances between the different branches of government, all this has become a very central part of the agenda of those who call themselves, you know, the national camp or the right wing in Israel. Uh, so we've, I think we've changed the discourse in that respect, uh, again, together with others. 
But I, I think one of the most important things uh, that we've been able to do here in the past 10 years is kind of encourage a whole new generation of young activists who, who are advancing our agenda, the agenda of, uh, of nation state of the Jewish people with freedom and representative democracy. Um, when I see a very capable, young, enthusiastic person who comes and says, you know, this is the issue that I, I want to deal with. I want to deal with, um, uh, with education policy. Uh, I, I want to deal with uh, unions and, and, and the right to work. I want to, and I, I see they've got the right ideas and they're very capable. Uh, I don't try to incorporate them. I try to encourage them. So we'll fund them. We'll help them with, uh, you, know, getting, you know, getting off the ground with the, the, the legal and, and, and other aspects. And they will be able to interact with um, with, with a whole um, atmosphere, you know, uh, 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 there's an environment here of, of young and active people who work together. We even actually have a department that's just in charge just of that, of helping independent groups that share our agenda to get things done more efficiently and to interact with each other uh, in, in a productive way. Right, so within civil society and... Exactly. So, so that's, that's, that's something that we care about a lot and I think that, that maybe is one of our most important achievements. Okay. Um, let's talk about labels for a second. You, Kohelet's been called both conservative and libertarian, uh, yeah. something that Hayek probably would have a little bit of an issue with. Um, so which is it? Okay, so, so those terms mean slightly different things in Israel than they do in the United States, okay? So, uh, and, and in Israel, they kind of go together very well. The, the idea is this, what, what do conservatives uh, believe? Conservatives um, respect families and communities, and in the case of Israel, the, you know, the Jewish nation, right? The Jewish people as a whole, and, and the traditions that are born by those families and communities and, and, and by the Jewish people, and, and want to be very cautious about you know, casting them aside and replacing them with, with, with some you know, newfangled ideas that, that could very well blow up in our faces, right? That's the conservative idea. Now, libertarians, in the, in the sense that the term is, is commonly used in Israel, just uh, believe uh, for good reason, that there are just lots of things that the state is not good at and should not be involved with. In particular, those things where the state is telling citizens what they should and should not be doing, right? So, so we want or the feeling state, or thinking or right. <laughs> so we, what we, we want, we want the state to only be doing what it's necessary for the state to do and what the state can do in an efficient and effective way. And we want other things to be done at the level of families and communities and so forth. Now, as you can see, in this respect, the conservative idea, the way it's defined in Israel, and the libertarian idea go very well together. We want to encourage families and communities and the institutions of the Jewish people to do things that they should be doing and let the state do only those things that the state should be doing. So that, that's, that's where conservatism and libertarianism work well together. I should tell you that there are small areas where there might be conflicts, you know, between the two ways of looking at things, but, but they're marginal and they don't need to concern us. Okay, but generally they, they coexist right. here. Um, talking about the liberal agenda specifically that you, that you have, uh, Kohelet was, uh, Kohelet took a strict position uh, on managing the COVID crisis. Um, it has been reported. Uh, so how does that align? Okay, that's a very fair question. So the first thing I want to say is that, that the fact that Kohelet took a strict position in terms of the way we ran our offices, well, we, we are a private organization and our belief is, and the libertarian belief is, that private organizations should make their own policies. The government shouldn't tell them what to do. The pri that though each organization should decide what they think is, is the appropriate response to a given situation. No, but I mean more, you know, right. the lockdowns and uh, clo right. uh, closing. I know, I know, I know what you meant, so I'm going to get to that. So in, in terms of what is the right government policy, different people at Kohelet 
had different ideas, right? So it, it wasn't that there was a Kohelet policy. Uh, it, it, our, the Kohelet policy internally was indeed very strict, but in terms of what the government should be doing, different people in Kohelet had different ideas. But we agreed on four principles that I think are very important. Uh, the first one is you have to get the facts right, okay? And, and I want to say that, that you know, the whole world used Kohelet's figures. Uh, Ariel Karlinsky did, you know, did a study on, on excess deaths in the world as a result of COVID. He did a very, very serious study. The whole world uses those figures, okay? So the first thing we wanted to do was say, let's get the facts right. Now, if, if you're a libertarian and you say, no, I'm just going to deny that COVID's a problem, okay? Nobody's dying. It's not a big deal. It's just the flu with good PR, right? Then you're not a libertarian, right? It means that you can't, you're not willing to confront facts that make your way of looking at the world difficult, right? Our attitude is, yes, we're libertarians, but first let's, let's get the facts. And the facts are that millions of people around the world have died. Many thousands of people died in Israel as, as a direct result of COVID, that the matter does need to be taken seriously, okay? So, so the first thing was we got the, you know, we did get the facts right. The second thing that we all agreed on here is that the government should do no harm, right? Now, if you look in the United States, the CDC early on um, was actually doing harm, right? They were saying, no, you can't use those tests, right? They, they literally, slowed things down that should have been moving faster. And also the, the fiscal policy in the United States and to a lesser extent in Israel was somewhat irresponsible. It, it, it caused a lot of damage down the line where people didn't want to go back to work because they didn't have incentives to go back to work. So our, our attitude was the government should do no harm. In Israel, I have to say, it, you know, unlike the CDC, the, I think the government acted in a very efficient and, and, and quick way, uh, uh, certainly in terms of, of getting the vaccines out. So all that was good. Uh, the fiscal policies here were just slightly irresponsible, but, but nothing like the United States, so that's good. The third thing is, okay, once you've got the facts and, and uh, you need to strike a balance between public safety and liberty. Okay, you, you can't just ignore one in favor of the other. It is the government's responsibility to deal with public safety during a pandemic, okay? They can't just say, just do whatever you want, deal with it. Even, you know, Milton Friedman would agree, right, that there are certain things the government would do, and I think that appropriate policies uh, for public safety during a pandemic would be among them, okay? So you've got to do something. On the other hand, um, you need to remember that Liberties, once they're taken away, it's very hard to get them back, all right? So, so you need to be very cautious, right? It's not like, yeah, what the hell, you know, we, we want to keep everybody safe. Let's just clo close down the airports. Let's lock everybody down for as long as we want. W once you get, you know, you know, a quick finger on the trigger with that kind of thing, it's very, very dangerous. So you really do need to strike the right balance. Now, Did they achieve this in the, the tracking? Remember the tracking mechanism? Yes, I remember the tracking mechanism. I, it, it, never, it never worked in the first place. So <laughs> if, if, if you're going to take away people's liberties, it, make it sure should, it's done right. Make sure that it works. Yeah. Okay. So, so in any event, you, you need to strike a balance. Now, there are different opinions about where that balance is, OK? I know that it's not at the extremes, but, but reasonable people can argue about where it is in the middle, uh, which leads us to the, to the, the fourth thing that, that we agreed here, which is you have to move quickly, OK? First of all, if, if you want to stop a pandemic in its tracks, you have to work quickly. And that works also in the other direction. So if you have imposed all kinds of limitations on what people can do, don't get lazy and say, oh yeah, we'll, we'll let it ride, we'll let it ride. The, the moment they're not necessary, you have to give people their full liberties back, okay? You can't, you can't say, yeah, you know, it's, uh, this, is, this isn't so bad. Once politicians, you know, get another tool you know, in the toolbox, right? And yeah, lockdowns, what an idea. No, 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 no. The, the, mim the minute that whatever restrictive policy you have is no longer absolutely necessary, you have to make it go away. So fast action. 
In any event, those are the four principles that we agreed on. You know, other than that, the government did what it did. You know, it's not, uh, it's not like we got to make the government's policy for it. Ah, a perfect segue to my next question. Uh, I have to say that Coelet's political affiliations are really confusing. Like, on the one hand, you have, uh, you know, a, a, a former senior fellow who's currently in the coalition. But on the other hand, a lot of the policies that you're pursuing would probably make most coalition members or parties uncomfortable. Um, on the left end of the spectrum. So, so which is it? Do you support this government? Are you against this government? Okay, so the answer is that, that for us, you know, coalitions are like the weather, right? Um, okay. In the sense that, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. We don't, we don't get to choose the coalition. And whatever coalition we have, we need to deal with it, okay? So if it's raining, we take an umbrella, right? Uh, our attitude is we have an agenda. We want to advance that agenda. and whatever government is in place, that's the government that we work with. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about your agenda for, for this coming year, perhaps a few years down the line, uh, considering that you know Israelis woke up uh, 2022, 2022 with a ridiculous rise in prices, uh, consumer costs, housing, utilities, you name it. I can only assume that this is one of the things you plan on, on touching, um, but could you tell me a little bit about what your... Sure. So we, we are, at any given time, dealing literally with dozens of different issues, um, whether they're, they're economics, whether they're um, checks and balances within the government, what, what, what's the appropriate um, balance, uh, whether it's what it means for Israel to be a Jewish nation state and how Israel can defend itself against BDS or, or, or accusations of apartheid and, and so forth. Uh, we're dealing with all of them, but I think I want to maybe highlight three areas that are of special, special importance to us and have, have certain salience in, in what we do and that I think are going to be very big issues in, in, in the year or two ahead. Uh, one of them is education policy. Okay, Israel has a very, very centralized uh, education system, and we've been working for years to change it. We're slowly making inroads. We can see the beginnings of changes. The, what needs to be done, first of all, is more school choice, okay? Parents need to be able to choose the school that their kids go to. And right now, parents have very, very limited choice in terms of, of you know, choosing their kid's school. Secondly, schools should have autonomy. If you have a principal in a school, that principal knows the population of his school. He knows the kinds of students that are there. He knows the families that send their kids there. He knows what they need let the principal decide what the curriculum should be. Now, I'm not saying there shouldn't be some core curriculum. Everybody needs to learn how to you know, do arithmetic and how to read and so forth. That, that, that's, not, that's not something that, that, that's up for discussion. But beyond the very, very basics, you want to let schools adapt themselves to, the, you know, to the, the population that they have and teach things that are appropriate for them. That's the second thing. And the third thing is that a, a principal needs to be able to choose teachers. He needs to be able to fire teachers that have proved themselves to be bad teachers, right? And you can't do that now in Israel, okay? The teachers union is such that there's almost nothing a teacher could possibly do. It doesn't matter how bad a teacher is. You can't fire a teacher because of the teachers unions. You also can't adapt the schedule of the school year, um, for example, to a pandemic, right? Uh, because the teachers union won't let you do it, okay? So we, we, need, we need to weaken the teachers unions so that uh, schools can be more responsive to the needs of, of students. All these things together basically mean that there would be something like competition between schools, right? If, if each school has its own character and schools uh, and, and parents can choose a school, well then the result is, right, the schools are effectively competing, which is a good thing. Competition is a good thing. That's what we want to encourage here, okay? So education is one area. Another area is they're all, you know, general free market stuff, right, uh, where there are particular areas that, that you know, there's clear room for improvement. One is the gig economy, right? There's no Uber or Lyft in Israel. Um, partly because of pressure from the taxi drivers union and so forth, but, but for many reasons, we, we want to get the gig economy kicking in Israel. That's very important. Secondly, the whole real estate market in Israel. I mean, housing in Israel is very expensive. Now, 
the one thing that the government should never do in, in, in such a case, and which is exactly what it has done, is say, oh, prices are too high. Why don't we subsidize housing, okay? We'll just give people money. That way, you know, it, it won't hurt as much when they have to buy a, a very expensive apartment. But that never works, and it never works for an obvious reason, which is that if you subsidize apartments, you drive demand, right? right? Of course. What you need to be doing is driving supply, okay? And the way to drive supply, there are many ways. One is get land out of the government's hands. The government owns all the land. Get it into private hands. It'll get used more efficiently if you get it into private hands. Secondly, less regulation in the housing industry. There's no reason why a building project has to take 15 years, which is how long it takes. If, if, you, if you deregulate, you let people do what needs to be done with just the minimum amount of, of regulation, uh, things will, will get done more efficiently. And, and finally, um, the whole regime of municipal taxes it doesn't make any sense. It needs to be rationalized. Uh, municipal taxes are very high for businesses, very low for, for housing. This, this gives the wrong incentives, Pe you know, every mayor, uh, it, it, you know, on whom we depend to develop the infrastructure so that you can develop housing, prefers to have a mall than to have residential, residential buildings and so forth. So all that needs to be, needs to be fixed up. And, and another area uh, in the economy that needs to be dealt with is the whole food industry, agriculture, food, and so forth, which is, you know, we were discussing before, is, is the most egregious example of places where, where there's, there's absurd government intervention, where there, you, you can't import stuff, where, where the entire industry is, is completely controlled, price controls, uh, uh, there, there are these you know, nut councils and honey councils and, and you name it councils that actually say you can produce this amount, you can produce that amount, it's just a controlled economy, it, it doesn't make any sense, we need... Sounds like a cartel, actually. Yes, well, yes, it's a, it's a, a government-supported cartel, that's the thing, because the government is behind all this. It's not just that they voluntarily do it, the government actually gives these councils statutory power. So that, that's absurd and that needs to be fixed. Um, and finally, the whole area of immigration needs, needs to be dealt with. What's going on now is, you know, uh, Israel is supposed to be a haven for Jews all around the world. This is the place where you come when, you know, you feel threatened and Jews are feeling threatened around the world. And then they come here and they discover that, oh, if you're a, a medical professional, well, the government might or might not recognize your, you know, your license to, to practice your profession. So we have people coming, believe it or not, from the United States, um, from France, from, from Western countries, and their licenses in the medical professions, podiatry is, is an example, but, but certain kinds of, of nurses and therapists, uh, where their licenses aren't, aren't recognized. So w we need to get past that. And the irony is that at the same time that Israel is making it difficult for Jews to come on Aliyah, at the same time we have policies that actually encourage illegal immigration, right? We have people infiltrating, infiltrating the borders because we have, we have policies here that make it comfortable for them to stay, right? We, we, we the courts in particular, but, but um, have made it difficult to, to deport somebody who entered the country illegally, and instead we're giving them all kinds of social benefits. So that's another area where incentive to, incentive to come and, and to stay. So that's another area that, that I think is gonna require a lot of work in the year or two ahead. So, something uh, that caught me a little bit early on in what you were saying in terms of, uh, in terms of the teachers. Um, I mean, I as a parent obviously find it incredibly frustrating to, you know, to be dependent on whether the union decides to strike or not and whether my kids are going to go to school the next day or not. But on the other hand, it's hard not to sympathize with you know, the, the desire for better working conditions. We saw this even more when it came to the medical community during, during the pandemic. So how, how easy is it you know, for you to be so critical of the unions when at the end of the day their job is to protect the workers? Right. Well, if only they were protecting the workers. The, the, um, uh, um, my opposition is not to the very idea of unions. I understand why there are unions, and unions could potentially actually do useful things for the workers. The problem is, uh, in Israel, workers are actually coerced to be in unions. So the first thing we're saying is, okay, no coercion, right to work. 
the, the law in Israel is that if one third of the workers in a given company want to unionize, then the other two thirds are forced into the union. So you don't even need a majority. And not only that, but if once historically that company had one third that supported unionizing, even if now nobody wants a union, right? They, they're, they're still coerced, right? So it's kind of grandfathered in. The, the second thing is that the unions, there's no transparency in the unions. Right. Nobody knows how much money the unions have. We know it's billions, right? We have no idea what they do with that money, right? So they're, they're, you know, if, if the rest of the country is regulated to death and we need less of it, the unions are not regulated at all. They do, they do whatever they want. And, and the third thing is that Unlike unions in, um, you know, in a private company, which are limited to, to some extent, right? If, if, if the union in a private company is going to make demands that are unreasonable, that, guy, that, that company is going to go out of business, right? So, uh, and all, all the workers are going, to, are going to be laid off, right? So, so workers know that they, you know, they have an interest in not pushing their demands too far. But public sector unions in Israel, which are the problematic unions, right? Uh, the public sector unions uh, pay no cost. The government, as far as they're concerned, has an infinite amount of money, right? They're, never, they're not afraid that the government, you know, if, they, if their demands are unreasonable or if they shut the government down, right, they, 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 they shut some government service down, that they're going to pay a price because the government is going to go out of business, right? Be, so so they, they, feel, they feel completely confident that they can make whatever demands they want. And in particular, they feel particularly confident that they can just paralyze the country. So if, if you know, it's the, uh, the train workers, they'll just shut down the train, right? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter, they're not afraid, right? The dock workers will just shut down the docks, right? They don't care, right? There, can be, there could be 100 ships uh, waiting, waiting out you know, in the sea to get in and, and, and all the businesses in Israel waiting to get, to get goods they couldn't care less, right? On the contrary, they know that they've got the government in a sensitive spot and uh, they, you know, they're probably gonna have their, all their demands met as a result. So what you need at a minimum is that in essential services, you can't just call a strike. You, you need at, at the very least to submit to, uh, to arbitration. So, you know, so that, that's a minimum. So again, just to summarize, I'm not against the idea of unions. I understand you know, that unions could theoretically be useful for workers is just that the uh, you know the the whole the rules in Israel are stacked in favor of the unions and against everybody else. We can't avoid talking about the the detractors of of the Kohelet uh, policy forum. Haaretz seems mildly obsessed with you guys. Why is that? Okay, Haaretz um, definitely hates us. Let's let's not beat around the bush. They you know. There was a time when they were writing one or two uh, articles against us uh, a week. It slowed down a little bit, thank God. But now, in terms of why they hate us, I mean, obviously that's a question that you should address to them rather than to me. However, since they do say uh, very frequently what it is that they hate about us, I, you know, I suppose I could summarize it. And I can summarize it in two words. There are two things that we love that they hate. One is Zionism and the other is, the other is freedom. Okay, it seems, it seems that they're offended by our support for Zionism and freedom. All I can say is I'm, I'm always flattered by, uh, by Haaretz's editorials. They say, hey, these, these guys are in favor of freedom instead of, instead of uh, uh, government control of this, that, or the other thing. And I say, yes, that's right. And they say, these guys are Zionists, and I agree. I say to them, thank you very much for that. That's absolutely right. I have no quarrel with you. So, yes. They've also accused you of importing American values into Israel that might be foreign to local hearts and minds. How do you respond to that? Look, if, if, you know, if they think that freedom is an American idea, I don't. But if they think freedom is an American idea, then I say, yes, OK, I'm, I'm importing that American idea. I, I'm, I'm totally in favor of it. I mean, in fact, I think that uh, it's clear that freedom is, first of all, a Jewish idea. It goes all the way back you know, to the Torah many thousands of years ago. It's also a Western idea. Um, so in, in any event, call it American, if you will. I'm in favor of it. They've also accused you of hiding, hiding your donors. How do you respond to that? 
Look, as far as, as, far as uh, what we disclose and don't disclose about our donors and from whom we take donations, et cetera, our, our policy is as follows. First of all, we comply with the law, both the letter and the spirit of the law. That's the first thing. The second thing is we don't take public funds, all right? So we're not taking money from any government. We're not taking money from the United Nations or from the EU who don't, wouldn't want to give us money anyway. Uh, we don't take money from the Israeli government, okay? We, we, more generally, we don't take any donations that have strings attached, okay? Any money that we take comes without strings attached. Uh, and as far as disclosing the identity of our donors, uh, we respect their privacy. They're, they're private people. Uh, they prefer to maintain their privacy. If they decide to announce that they're our donors, that's certainly their, their right, and they can do so any time. But as long as they don't want to do that, we, we're just respecting their right to privacy, and we're not disclosing it either. That's fair. Uh, just before we wrap up, what can you tell me about what you've learned maybe in the past 10 years as head of Kohelet? Have, would you have changed anything? I've learned a lot of things, I have to, honestly. The, the first thing that I learned, though, is, as the head of Kohelet is to not get in the way Okay, there is not a single topic in the world about which there isn't somebody at Kohelet who knows it better than I do. Okay, so there are lawyers here who know more about law than I do. There are economists here who know more about economics. There are political scientists who know more about politics. Okay, um, my job is just to let them work. Okay, every now and then I need to manage some egos. You know that 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 that's part part of the job, but. I don't tell them, no, this is, this is what you should be doing and this is how you should be doing it. I let them do their jobs. Uh, the second thing is, look, there are certain issues that are just scissor issues. They're scissor issues in the sense that people w within, within our own you know, ideological group are going to disagree with each other, right? So for example, we talked before about conservatism and, and libertarianism, and I said, well, you know, they work well together. Right? You know what? They do, 99% of the time. There are certain issues about which conservatives and libertarians might agree, okay? Should LSD be legalized? Should prostitution be legalized? The weird thing is these are not questions about which people, you know, kind of are just all wishy-washy and that's why there's not a clear answer. No, every person that you ask about something like that knows exactly what the answer is. It's perfectly clear and they think that anybody who thinks the opposite of them is a complete idiot, okay? And nevertheless, you'll discover that half the people think that it should be legalized and half the people think that it should not be legalized. Now, the answer is yes. One of the lessons I learned is avoid those issues. There is no particular reason why we need to be there's enough low-hanging fruit, right? I mean, in a, in a country where, where it takes you a year just to open a business because of all the crazy requirements, the last thing I need to do is focus my attention on legalizing prostitution, right? It just, there's no reason for it. The third lesson we learned is that, that it is completely pointless to come to a politician and say, here's a policy that I think you should advance. Um, even if they agree with you completely, it doesn't matter unless you come with text. You need to come and say, this is the law that you need to pass. This is the government decision that you need to pass. It has to be written out. Now, it, it, that's not what the law is going to look like by the time it you know, goes through the meat grinder in the Knesset. But the important thing is that when a politician sees that you have specific text, they are motivated to to do something with it. They say, okay, otherwise they're going, okay, what am I gonna do? I have nothing, to, they, can, they can take your text, they can, you know, they can table it, and, and that begins a discussion, right? Uh, with, without that, you've done absolutely nothing. Okay, the, the fourth lesson is never take credit, okay? Which is why when you, know, you asked me about achievements, I didn't wanna mention any specific laws that we did, even though there are lots of them, because if, if after a law passes, you come and say, Oh yeah, that was our law, we did that. Well then the politician who, you know, who did it is not gonna be motivated to do it the next time, right? That, that, that politician is, you know, rightly so because they have to take responsibility for it in the end if, if, if the law doesn't work the way you thought it would, right? There's always unintended consequences. So if they're gonna take the responsibility, 
they also have to get the credit, right? So uh, if, if we march around going, yeah, that's our law, that's our law, um, that's, that is not going to give the right incentives to the people that we work with. Uh, also, you need to understand, if you're dealing with a government minister, for example, uh, the bureaucrats have a lot more power than we do and that the minister does. Some new minister plops into an office, okay? There's a whole bureaucracy there of hundreds of people who were there before him, and not only that, they're gonna be there after him as well, okay? As far as they're concerned, this minister is a guest, right? This, he's just there, he's just passing through, they just have to deal with him somehow. So if you wanna get something done with a minister, you need to understand that you're up against some very, very stiff competition, and, and you, better, you better get to that minister early on in the administration if you have any chance, because eventually they're gonna be captured completely by the bureaucrats around them, okay? And the final message is one that, that you raised before correctly, which is that in the end, if we don't sell our ideas to the public, then they're not gonna pass. It's not enough to convince politicians. You really need to change the culture. So when it comes, for example, to you know, socialism and free market economics, you know, that's, that's an area in which when we began 10 years ago, we were an underdog, right? It was kind of part of Zionism that the state should be taking care of you, right? And socialism was just baked into it. So we started out behind and we've done a lot of catching up, but, but the only way that we've been able to get the government to change things, and this government, by the way, uh, whatever else we might think about them has lately been doing some very, very important things in terms of free market economics, deregulation, um, you know, uh, limiting licensing requirements, allowing imports, and so forth. All that is possible only because for the last 10 years the public has been hearing this message and the culture has really changed in favor of freedom and liberty. Well, that's, I think, the biggest achievement of all. <laughs> Professor Moshe Kopel, it has been such an honor to speak with you and to learn from up close about what it is that you guys do. And I, I hope we speak again uh, ahead of Kohelet's 20th anniversary. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much.